All right, uh, let's get going, everyone. Welcome to the STR Stronger Together Meet the Scholar series. Uh, today is our second installment, and I'm so excited to be um, talking with Kathy Eisenhart today. So thank you so much for joining us, um, really from all over the world. So looking at this participant list is really inspiring to see um, how many of us can actually be connected at one time during this really weird time. Um, I think the phrase, someone needs no introduction is a little bit trite, but that might actually be true of Kathy, <laughs> unlike many of us. Um, I think that all of us are probably familiar with her research in strategy, um, and it's important that it's had to all of us in our own um, intellectual development. But let me highlight a few things about Kathy before we talk to her. So um, Kathy is the Stanford Asherman MD professor and a faculty member in the Stanford Technology Ventures Program um, in the School of Engineering at Stanford. Um, she did her PhD at Stanford, but in the business school. So some of you may or may not realize that the engineering school and Stanford school and, and business school at Stanford are two distinct entities. So she moved, but not too far. Um, as you may know, Kathy's authored over 100 articles um, in research and business journals um, and has written two books on strategy and dynamic environments. And I, I think we'll get to talk to her a little bit about um, writing books versus writing articles. Um, I checked yesterday, and in terms of the impact, uh, Web of Science currently has Kathy's citations at around 52,000 um, citations to her work, which I think um, highlights the impact that she's had on so many different areas of strategy and strategic research. Um, in entertainment industry, there's an EGOT if someone wins an Emmy, what is it, Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and a Tony. I don't know what the EGOT in our field is, but I think Kathy may actually have won that. So her, her um, accolades are many and well-deserved. So she's won awards for scholarly contribution, um, both from the academy and also from different governments like the Swedish government. She's won awards for her mentorship of students, her contribution um, to the development of doctoral students, um, and also awards for um, the impact of her papers. Um, I think that as we are, um, you know, in this time trying to connect with um, scholars that have had a lot of impact and whom we can learn from. There's no one who I think um, exemplifies a, a career of really thoughtful and impactful research in Kathy, and I'm so excited to be talking with her today. So I'm gonna stop right now, um, and just a couple of things as we get going. So there will be a chance for Q&A um, after I talk with Kathy for a little bit. So if you have questions, put them into the chat, and I'll be calling on you to ask those questions a bit later. Um, and then also, if you're just joining us, please make sure that you're on mute for this portion. Um, we've all had those terrible feedback experiences on Zoom. We want to skip that um, right now. Um, all right, so Kathy, welcome so much. It's good to see you and Sunny Palo Alto there, uh, making us all wish maybe that we were quarantining in California <laughs> right now. So, yeah. Well, good morning, good morning, Emily. Good morning, everybody. And, and oh, it's probably not morning everywhere, but uh, thanks so much, everybody, for taking some time out of your day to, uh, to uh, visit with us. One thing that's really nice about this format is that we have a chance to maybe ask and learn um, from scholars some things that don't necessarily come up when they're presenting a research paper. So I thought today that we could begin by um, having Kathy tell us um, a little bit about your, you know, where you grew up and your path to doing a PhD. Okay, sure, Emily, I can start there. I was, um, maybe I'll start at the beginning. I was born in East Chicago, Indiana, so in the Midwest. Um, I'm the oldest of four kids, so I'm, I have two brothers and a sister. Um, my dad is actually Canadian, although he moved to the States as, you know, as a, while he was still in school. Um, uh, I'm from a family of, of engineers, so of the four kids, um, my sister and I, one of my brothers, my, then my dad, my grandfather, we're all, we're all engineers and science people, or bankers, so that's kind of been two things my family does. Um, let's see. I. When I was, before I started school, we really traveled around a lot with my dad's job, um, but, and settled in, in, in the Boston area, outside Boston, that's really where I grew up. Um, so little, little known fact, uh, Mike Tushman and I are from the same town. Um, and then as I was a little bit older, in fact, we actually know some of the same people, although we didn't actually know each other. Um, and then when I was a little bit older, we moved to the next town over, Winchester, which is where Samina lives now. Um, so a little bit of, I don't know, background of, you know, kind of what I was up to. Um, I went to Brown as an undergrad where I was a mechanical engineer. And I was, um, I was the only one of 120 
the only woman out of 120 engineers at Brown. So it was kind of a, it was, you certainly were noticed. So there were some good things and some bad things about that, but it was mostly a lot of fun and, and great. Um, let's see, you asked me about how did I get to academics? Um, I said I was a mechanical engineer at Brown, but then I, I didn't really like fixing my car, you know, as, as, as it turns out. And so I got into computer science pretty early. So I actually have a master's in computer science and worked in software for a couple of years. Um, I also got married right out of college. So I was married pretty young. Uh, I then I then wanted to do, you know, I decided I wanted, I always wanted to, to teach. I always wanted to be a professor since probably I was 19. Um, and I wanted to I be a professor. I have an interesting, like, at that young age, no, like, yeah, why? <laughs> I don't know. That's why I always wonder, why can't other people think that? No, but I, I, I did have an idea. And 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 because I, I always I always liked school and I always liked ideas and I didn't like having a boss. And I fantasized that that professors had June, July and August off. Now, of course, <laughs> I know that's not true. By the way, what job can I have? And I thought teaching little kids would be you know, too much discipline and college kids would be easy to teach and fun. So I had this idea of what it was going to be like and how I'd be having these amazing summers off, which didn't exactly turn out the way I planned. But um, yes, yeah, so that's how I, I got started. I, I was a doctoral student at GSB. Um, I actually started there. I had my kids young, so I had my kids in my mid twenties. Um, so I remember interviewing for the doctoral program at GSB, seven months pregnant with my son. And I remember the, the dean who was interviewing me basically sort of blowing me off. I think I didn't look serious maybe for some reason, like maybe being pregnant was not serious. Um, but I had really, I'm a really good test taker. And so I had, I had great test scores. So even though I had never taken a social science course and I'd actually chosen courses in college that didn't have paper writing, like I'd explicitly figure out whether I had paper or not and then not take a course that had a paper. Um, I actually ended up then at GSB with great test scores uh, and nothing else really to go for um, and learned how to write uh, in, in graduate school. So that sort of took me into graduate school. Um, when I was there, you know, I had to think of, of a dissertation and I started with a baby because, you know, I you had know, seven months pregnant, then the baby came. Uh, and then I had another, I had my daughter, um, about two and a half years later. So I had two little kids, two, two preschoolers. Um, and I was, into, I was into getting it done. I, I had in my mind the dissertation that ultimately a dissertation is the union card to join the club of faculty. And, and so I really thought of it very pragmatically like that. And as I thought of a topic, um, the big, the, the hot, it was an interesting time because I, I, I graduated in 1982 uh, and it was an interesting time because some of the big theories like transaction cost, agency theory, institutional theory, ecology were all brand new and a lot of it was happening at Stanford. And I remember I, we went to a, um, we used to have a, an annual beach conference and at one of the conferences, Mike Cannon was talking about ecology and Jeff Pfeffer and Jerry Salanza were talking about resource dependence and John Meyer and some other people were talking about institutional theory. And sort of all the new theories were like right then. And I remember as grad students, we were all saying, you know, this isn't really that great. You know, these theories, we don't like these theories that well, which just shows, you know, just goes to show you, what do you know when you're, you know, 24 uh, or 26? Um, because of course, all those theories became very influential. In terms of thinking about my own dissertation, I actually, my dissertation is on agency theory. Um, and the reason is that, uh, that when I was a student, the, probably the hottest theory at GSB was agency theory. It was brand new, it was taking off, but it was all being done mathematically. So it was all formal models. And I'm, I'm, I'm ultimately a field person. And ultimately I like to see if things really work and maybe that's, by the way, am I talking too fast? Am I good? You're great. Um, I think as an engineer, I, I do like to solve problems and I do like reality. And so I thought to myself, well, all this, all this math modeling is great, but I wonder if it's actually true. And so I decided to test agency theory and it was pretty easy to test because no one had tested it before. So there was like, it was wide open. And so, but I had these little kids, I had these two little kids and my husband, um, 
it was a CEO. So I had a young, I mean, my husband, he, he was like a 30 year old CEO. So he was really busy and I had these little kids. And so I tested my hypotheses at the Stanford Shopping Center. And my teenage babysitter helped me collect the data. So it was, I think, like, like I don't think I could even get it published now, but I, so we went to the Stanford Shopping Center and we looked at whether salespeople were paid on commission versus a, an hourly wage. And agency theory has a variety of predictions about that and we tested those predictions. Um, which leads me to, I think, to the maybe the first point I wanted to make to maybe to, to junior scholars or to doctoral students is to remember that your dissertation is not the greatest thing you're ever going to do. Or if it is, you have a really boring life to sort of peak at such a young age. You know, you want to, you want to peak a little later. So I, I think dissertations are not about agonizing, they're about getting it done. And I never loved agency theory and I left agency theory and many of you may not even know I ever published an agency theory. Um, but I did, and, and, it, and, and it worked well for me. I never liked agency theory. I always thought it was kind of a boring theory, but, um, but it got me into the game and, and when, at a time when I was super busy and just had to execute. Um, so that would be, I think, where I, where I, I got, got into to dissertation. Kathy, would you mind connecting the dots real quick then? So I think we all know your agency theory review piece then. So you just said you didn't really like agency theory, you didn't publish it much. Like, Connect the dots of that piece that's had like such an impact on, you know, all of our strategy seminars, for example. Yeah, the agency theory paper. Well, um, what happened was, uh, I, I, some of you may know my, my colleague, Bob Sutton. And Bob Sutton was actually very influential for me, um, even though he was another junior faculty. But, but um, he had this slogan, three papers makes a stream. And so, and I think he was right. I think because the idea behind that slogan is, if you just write one paper on something, no one remembers it and you don't have really any impact. But if you write three, you start to have a body of work that people recognize you for. And, and, and then people read all three, they don't just read the one. So what happened with my dissertation was I published an article in Management Science and then I published what I thought was a great article in AMJ on agency and institutional theory. And then I did the AMR piece because I needed a third. And I wrote that AMR piece, um, which I think, at least for a long time, it was one of the top 10, or top, top five actually, top five all time AMR sites was, was that paper. I wrote it really fast because I knew agency theory really well. And it was at a time where I had a couple of papers that basically had no revisions. They were just accepted and that was one of them, was my AMR. So I just really wrote it because AMR was the, was, was, the, was getting to be a buzz, but I didn't think most organizations and strategy people were reading the formal models. And I could translate it, those, those models into what was meaningful and what was new. And in terms of what was meaningful and what was new, I thought also it was interesting that what, what the economists thought was new was what we think is old. And what we think is new was what they thought was old. So, old and new and contributions sort of depend on where you're sitting. So they thought some of the ideas around, um, I don't know, uncertainty and motivation were interesting. Whereas I too, it was novel, I think for us was more, maybe more some of the predictions around risk. So that, does that, does that connect the dots? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. So, um, so you did your dissertation and then yeah. do you want to tell us about moving into an academic job and the questions that started getting you maybe more excited that you thought were less boring? Okay, <laughs> you're right. Uh, yeah, because I really, I don't want to offend anyone who does agency theory. It just wasn't, just wasn't my theory. Um, yeah, what happened was I, um, you know, my family loved the Bay Area. I loved the Bay Area. Uh, and so I didn't want to move. So I figured out the way to stay at Stanford is to change schools. And changing into engineering was easy for me because you know I'm an engineer and I'm you know I have a whole you know background and family we're all engineers so it's pretty easy, and so I came to the engineering school here at Stanford, um, actually as an affirmative action hire, and as I think back at my job talk it was a really pathetic job talk but you know I guess it turned out the department got an extra billet if they hired me so I think that was part of it, um, but anyway uh, so I ended up in engineering. Uh, what happened next was I asked a couple of random things for me. Um, one was I started working with Kay Schoenhoven, 
who was a couple years ahead of me in the doctoral program. Um, and she was, her husband was very well connected in the semiconductor industry. And so we, I started working with her on the semiconductor industry. And then at the same time, Jay Bourgeois, who was also a couple of years ahead of me, and he was on the faculty at GSB, we happened to be riding to a, we had this annual beach conference I mentioned before. We went, we were, we decided to carpool to the beach conference together. And we started talking about research ideas. And he was saying, hey, let's, you know, I'm interested in doing something on decision making, strategic decision making. I said, oh, that sounds really interesting. And then he said, yeah, and I think we ought to do it on banking or on the computer industry. And I said, well, you know, I thought, you know, well, my dean's going to way prefer the computer industry. Let's do the computer industry. So we decided to do a study of, of the computer industry and how, how the strategic decisions were made. And it was a very disruptive time. Uh, you know, it was when the microprocessor really started. And so we started, we started the study and we had this plan. We were going we to gather data from about 80 computer companies that had just started in the Bay Area. So we had this plan. And we gathered data by, on about four or five, and there was a special issue. And we said, oh, hey, you know, we're already finding some interesting stuff. Let's just write this up. And so we wrote up these, I think it was four cases, actually, or maybe it was five, something like that. And so we wrote up, I wrote up my first case study. And we asked Bob Sutton how to do it, because Bob's dissertation was on cases. And I said, Bob, how do we do this? And so he kind of gave us tips. And Ari Lewin was the, 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 the department head at Management Science. And for those of you who, first of all, Ari is also the founder of Organization Science, just to put Ari in context. But Ari, for whatever reason, was always very supportive of women. And I think he really wanted to publish some of my things. I think he really saw me as an up and coming woman. And I think he really was, you know, he, I think he, he wanted to bend over backwards to make that paper happen. Um, and so that was how I ended up doing technology companies and decision making, and then on into things that I think really were more what I, what I like, you know, the, the tech world, uh, timing, speed, that sort of thing. Um, and I've always thought in ways people are their theories. So like, like, I, like Jeff, Jeff Pfeffer was on my committee. And as many of you know, he's resource dependence, power and politics. That is like so Jeff in person. Um, and other people are, you know, agency, you know, agency theory people are kind of like Oliver Williamson and TCE. Oliver is TCE. Um, well, I'm more, I'm more what I study, you know, and, you know, I, I, I drive a sports car. I'm kind of like things fast, you know, so I, it's sort of like, I think I'm, I think I am what I do too. And so I got into technology and I got into the cases and I got into sort of what you, what now most people think of me as actually doing. Yeah. Would you mind saying a few more, uh, a little bit more about that transition from um, it, into cases really, right? So coming from your engineering background, having never written a paper, you sort of casually mentioned, and then I learned how to write in business and <laughs> PhD program. Um, and then, you know, one of the things you are extraordinarily well known for is, you know, different comparative case methods. Um, right. And you could work on that. Yeah, well, well I, as I say, I kind of stumbled into the case thing because we had this special issue and we already had something interesting. Um, and so I, I have Tony Tong on my screen, by the way, should I? I don't know. Anyway, I'll keep talking. Um, That's fine. Yeah, you just have a view thing going on. You're fine. Oh, all right. Um, yeah, I, I stumbled into the cases and then learned from Bob how to do the cases. You yeah. know, he really taught me how to do it. Um, and it, and it, it, was, it, it worked well for me. Oh, no. No, you. If you could mute yourself if you're not on mute, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so what I did was um, I yes about the transition yeah I, I learned from Bob and we kind of learned on this first paper and then I um, there was another special issue on theory building in AMR and and I thought well you know this is what I'm learning how to do I theory build and it actually fit really well with an engineering background because because engineers do think in terms of theories and boundary conditions in a way that I think a lot of organizations and strategy people don't. You know, so, so in engineering, you're always thinking about well, what are the boundary conditions? You know, is it, is it laminar flow or turbulent flow or whatever it is? So we always think about, um, about boundary conditions. Um, and, then, and then I think, I think and I've always been a person who is more of an inductive thinker. So if, you know, if I take 
if I, if I, you know, if you take the, if I take the Myers-Briggs, I always come out as that inductive person, you know, you go from data to, to ideas, whereas most of the people in our field are actually the other way around. I think it's N's versus S's. And so I've always been into the data and trying to understand the pattern. And so that really made cases really work well for me. And then my papers are, I would say what I can do is I can write logically. I don't think I can write the great novel, but I can write logically. And that's, I think, what, what theory building from cases was oh. for me, was, was being able to write logically. Okay. So, so that, does that answer the question or did I just talk a lot? No, I, I think it's, it's just interesting to gain in, insight. I think that, you know, especially as a doctoral student, I think, you know, that learning how to write is a problem. I think for many of us, myself included, we're still learning how to write, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to learn to write. And you do have to, I had to get used to people criticizing me because I don't think, at least certainly for me, and I think for a lot of people, you, you want to make your, your work so polished that people can't criticize. But when you do that, you waste a lot of time. It's really better. You should regard it as I've learned. You should regard criticism as flattery because people were interested enough to take the time to read it to say something as opposed to kind of uh, 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 you know, great job kind of, oh, fabulous job, I loved your paper, but you know, they aren't, there's no real depth to that. Mm. So I actually wrote, so then I wrote that AMR paper that, that got to be probably my biggest hit in the building theories. I wrote that about my own experience. So that was really very a very autobiographical paper where, that I wrote with the idea in mind of what I would have liked to have known at the start of trying to do that kind of work. So I said, oh, I would want to know how do you figure out a research question and, and so on. So that was very much written that way. And an irony is that Bob was thinking about writing for that special issue too, about case studies and theory building. But I was already doing it. And he said, oh, Kathy, you take that. And so I owe a lot to Bob that he didn't try to jump in and be a co-author or preempt me or whatever. And, and he sort of just let me, let me go for it. And, it, and it, it's obviously become a very influential paper. And it's another one of those papers right at the time where there, were, there was no revision on that paper. That was just pretty much what I sent in was what got published. But it was, again, very, very much how, what I would wanted to know, what I would have wanted to know had I been writing, had I, you know, when I started. Yeah. One thing you just said was, you know, about learning how to take criticism. What sort of um, tips do you have from your own experiences or you've seen working with doctoral students? Because I think that's something that, you know, your ego is so wrapped up as a scholar and the ideas that you present. And it's really difficult sometimes to, you know, like how, how polished should you make something before you try to get that feedback? What are your thoughts on that? I, I think, I think I try to give feedback and I also and I take it better if if people say something good about what I'm doing. So, oh, you know, you did this and this and this really well, but you know, here's where you could improve. Mm -hmm. And so I think that style of criticism works better. I think people receive it better when they when they get some pats on the back of, of, of the things that they're doing well. And when they get when they get the re reinforcement of what they're doing well. So I'd say that was probably what I've learned about giving criticism and now getting criticism, I actually don't care that much. But you know, but that was, this is now and that was then in yeah. terms of the theory. Yeah. Um, one thing that, um, so in the introduction, I neglected to say that I've benefited from Kathy being a co-author and a mentor. She was on my dissertation committee. So, you know, I, um, I got experience working with Kathy as a doctoral student, as a junior scholar, but, you know, I know that many of us are aware of your engagement with doctoral students um, and how many you've had. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about working with doctoral students advice you have about when junior faculty should jump in and even how, um, you know, what makes it an effective collaboration for you? Yeah, uh, yeah, doctoral students are, are tricky because a great, a great doctoral student is such a joy and a not so great doctoral student is like, oh my gosh. You know, so, so I guess my advice would be early in your career, you should work with more senior people. So I learned a lot from Jay and Kay when we worked together. Um, and so I would say early on, it's best to work with more senior people because the review process is something you have to apprentice and experience. You can't just read a book about how to go through the review process. So I think early on, I would stay away from doctoral students. You know, maybe be on a committee, but not work with doctoral students. 
Also, if you're too junior, the doctoral students don't necessarily respect you enough. So it's gotta be a little bit more distance. Uh, but when you're a little, when you're, you know, you're a few years into your career, I think it can be useful to co-chair with somebody who's more experienced, um, which I, I did, I, I, didn't, I didn't experience that myself, but I did that with both Rita Cotilla and Chuck Easley. Their first doctoral student or two, we, we actually co-chaired. And I, I like to think they learned some things about with working with students. As far as my, my own working with students, um, I, I haven't actually thought of my own research project probably since my dissertation. I'm, I'm not that good at just coming up with an idea. I'm better at taking an idea and seeing the promise in that and seeing where you could take that idea. Um, and so, in, definitely in your, in your dissertation, Emily, seeing what, how institutional theory was really the story you wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. um, but so I so I've always been I've always had this um, I don't know uh, kind of formula with doctoral students of they think of the topics and as long as it has something to do with technology firms they can think of whatever they want but it's always kind of in the box of technology firms and I can then I think the value I add is tweaking the question and the focus and saying, well, you know, if you turned it this way, if you turned it that way, if you asked the question this way, you'd have a better dissertation. Mm -hmm. And so I've found that students like to have it be their own idea. So for example, Chris Bingham always wanted to do an international study, and he did. And you know, other people had things they really, Melissa Grabner always wanted to do acquisitions, and she did. Um, and what that does for me is it, it keeps me fresher, because I'm not it's not my own agenda just stepping down. It's always sort of my agenda because it's about technology companies and in problems I'm interested in, but it's also got the freshness of what other people want to do and study. So it's kind of a, um, I'm trying to think of a good, a good word for it, but it's essentially, it's not my own path and it's not random. It's that, you know, simple, sort of simple rules, edge of chaos way of thinking. So I'm getting some randomness from the students and I'm getting some 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 structure around the somewhat narrow topic area. I think the other thing I'll say about grad students to PhD students is if it's not working out, you should let them go. You know, you know that it's, at Stanford we have a kind of a two-year review. If somebody's really not not getting it, they're not going to get better in four years. It's you know they're probably a smart person in the wrong place. And so I'm a believer in in letting people go. And, and move on with their lives if, if this isn't the right career for them. So I end up with always working with really fabulous students. Um, and I think students that maybe we did let go, I think we're happier in, in another place. Okay, um, thank you. You just mentioned um, simple rules. That's one thing I think that's you know interesting seeing the last um, you know decade or so, you're moving into writing a couple of books. Do you wanna talk about your experiences writing books as opposed to research papers? and? Um, why you decided to do that? Um, yeah, I, I, I wrote my first book, Competing on the Edge, uh, with Shona Brown. Uh, and Shona was a, a great doctoral student, but when she, when she finished, she really wanted to, she didn't want to be a professor. She want, she, and so she wanted to work for McKinsey. So she was a perfect student to work with because if you, as, a, as, as an advisor, if you're too involved in your student's world, they don't get to be independent. You know, in the academic world, but that wasn't true for her at McKinsey. It was actually a plus for her to write a book. Um, I wanted to write a book because I was tired of 35 page papers and because I wanted to have an impact bigger than just the academy. Um, I, 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 maybe I'll, I'll segue slightly to a piece of advice. I think my, my advice would be to focus on being a great academic to full professor. You know, don't get off the track. Don't suddenly develop your consulting skills just because you just got tenure. I would say stay focused on becoming a full professor. And then after that, you can do all sorts of things. And the thing that I wanted to do was, um, was, write, was write a book. And I wanted to write a book that, was, that my colleagues would respect and that business professionals would really like. And we were able to do that with Competing on the Edge. That was a book that sold almost, probably almost 100,000 copies. So it was sort of an A minus hit. It won the Terry Award at the Academy. Um, and it took me to another world uh, where I started getting speaking engagements. There's like, there's like orbits in academics. And I got into the orbit of talking to CEOs. My clients were CEOs. 
because it was a fairly sophisticated book intellectually. You know, it was, it was based on complexity theory. Um, and, and CEOs are, are interesting people typically and interested in ideas. And so it took me into that world. It took me to Davos, um, so World Economic Forum. So I, you know, I was standing in line with Madeleine Albright or Phil Knight or Michael Dell complaining about how, how we don't like lines or you know, what do you do for jet lag? So it took me into this whole other world of people and impact and influence. And it was I'm pretty amazing from that standpoint. And the other thing that we did for Shona was when she decided she didn't want to be a consultant anymore, her first job was Google. And she was the VP of basically all of Google except search. And a lot of our ideas from competing on the edge were then she implemented at Google. So it was pretty exciting to see Google doing our stuff. Um, so that's why competing, but then, but then what happened after competing on the edge was um, in, the, in, in the sort of, the, in, the, in the Davos, um, you know, executive world, you're, you're only as interesting as your, as your newest idea. I, I, I kind of ran out of ideas. And so then I pulled back and went back into research and PhD students. So, you know, Melissa Gradmer, Philippe Santos, Jeff Martin, Chris Bingham, Pinar Ozcan, sort of a whole string of doctoral students. Um, and I started developing the simple rules ideas, which had come out of competing on the edge. It just wasn't that explicit. Um, and Don Sull and I, who was my co-author on that, had been talking about simple rules for a long time. And, and I wanted to work with Don because he's a great guy. But I also wanted to work with Don because he can write in a way I can't write. And so in Simple Rules, which we published in 2015, um, that book, I wanted to write a book that my friends would read. I wanted to write a Malcolm Gladwell book. So a book that wasn't just a business book, but that was a book that lots of people would read. And that was my goal in that book. And I wanted to write, yeah, I wanted, basically I wanted to write a Malcolm Gladwell book. And Don had better writing skills than I did to do that. He could turn a phrase. And then his son, every so often, his son had been president of Harvard Lampoon, and his son could really turn a phrase. And so every so often we'd say, Charlie, take a look at this chapter and tell us how we could make it cooler. And he'd do that. So I wanted to have a book that in that book that was bigger than a business book and that was really the, a broad audience book. And it was very fun because what I ended up doing for the promotion of that was I was on radio and television doing all sorts of things. Like I was on the Rand, I was very big on the Rand Paul network because it was a, it's, it's a small government book. Um, I, I, di I did sports and brewskis shows. I did, you know, Portlandia back to nature type shows. I did all sorts, I went to Wall Street. So I did all kinds of shows and, and talking to kinds of people because simple rules could be about, you know, how do you get a better internet date? Or it could be about your business. It could be about a lot of things. So it was really fun from that point of view to do that book. Um, I also realized at the end of the day that Malcolm Gladwell does write better than I do. Um, and there's a reason why he's a journalist and I'm not. But it was, it was, it was a fun, it was, it was fun to do because we, I got to write about, you know, insects and sports and, and companies and I got to write about all sorts of things. And so if you read that book, most of the sports examples are mine. Most of the war and business examples are Don's or finance examples. Um, we kind of mix on some of the, the nature stuff, but it was just fun to write about stuff that was different. And now I'm back into more of the research world again. Yeah. Um, thank you for explaining, like sharing that sort of path through us. It's really interesting to hear how you decide where, you know, your ideas are going to develop in a book or a, a, a um, paper format. Um, yeah, I'm a big believer that, that, that Many full professors should write books that if you just stay in the 35, I mean, you could also be a dean or you could be a journal editor, you, but you have to be something other than just 35 page papers your whole career, I think. You know, you've got to find something else that's different. And I think books is one of the ways you can be doing something interesting, impactful, um, taking you to new worlds kind of thing. Yeah, that's a great perspective on the sort of opportunities that this career path affords, right? It, we get so focused on tenure and maybe promotion of full, we forget that there's a whole world out there. Yeah, and you can become like, like, like Samina is obviously taking leadership roles and editing. I, I personally don't like editing. Um, other people become deans, other people you know, write books. So I think, and then people go through phases, I think, and, and, and change their game. Mm -hmm. That's great. 
Um, just a reminder, everyone, in a few minutes, we'll open it up for Q&A. So if you want to start putting questions into the chat box, I can start calling um, on you in, in a few minutes there. Um, one um, sort of final question, and you've hit a lot of these points here, Kathy, but as you think about the students, the junior scholars that you've worked with, um, that you've sort of seen different things, what kinds of general themes or advice would you have on how to kind of, you know, get through this career that can be so stressful, particularly finishing the dissertation or getting <laughs> tenure, um, and kind of sustaining the energy to um, have a career where you're excited to write a book 15 years later or whatever it is? Yeah, yeah, I know it's, it's a hard career because we get so so little positive reinforcement. You know, I, I you know, like all of you, I get a review that says I loved your paper, and then it's three pages of why they didn't love your paper. Um, but I, I do think those couple things I said before, you know, for junior people, don't think of your dissertation as your best work. Work with all, work with more senior people to get to learn how to to learn how to deal with the review process, and then really consolidate around that three papers makes a stream. I think I think those are the key, the key ideas um, that I'd say. Um, and then I, I, I don't know that this is always possible, but I've always a bit tried to catch the wave, sort of see what's coming and be there. Um, so whether it was agency theory or, or qualitative research, or, or I, I just did something on machine learning. Um, I, I sort of like to see, okay, what's happening? And kind of, kind of being out in front of that. And I'm not sure I answered your question. No, that's great. And you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I put up a slide of accolades of, that Kathy's one being with. And I think one of the accolades that you may have noticed on there is last year that Kathy and a student of hers, Ron Tadar, won the best paper award, PhD paper award, right, for the STR division for that machine learning paper, right? Yeah, so we did. We did. Yeah, it was best paper for STR. Best paper. Sorry. Yeah, for STR. So yeah. um, maybe you could tell us. And I think it just came out. Is that right as well in journal? It just came out. Yes. Yeah. Um. So, you know, maybe a nice way as we kind of move into the Q&A here is to tell us about your current projects and things you're excited about. So you mentioned machine learning. What else? Yeah, well, let me, well, I'll tell you about a little bit about the machine learning. Um, uh, it, it, we, we started, the paper is about revenue models and it's about, and, and the, the data are app store data. Um, and we want to understand what are, what are what are the optimal revenue models, and is it you know freemium or or, or, or free or what whatever? Um, and we sort of I don't know I guess I was driven by another special issue. We put it into a special issue, and we it was really kind of lame. And then we realized because Ron Ron worked for Spotify, and Ron is a data scientist, so he knew the machine learning part. And we said you know maybe we could do something with machine learning. And as we got into it, what we saw, I think he already knew it, but I, I saw. So, um, that that qualitative research, particularly the way I do it in terms of building theories from cases, is fundamentally about pattern recognition. And machine learning is fundamentally about pattern recognition. And so they're really, even though the scale is different, so case studies, you're looking at maybe six companies or something like that, or four, or some small number, and machine learning, you're, you're dealing in millions. Ultimately, they're both, they're both intellectually the same, in the sense that you are coming up with patterns, testing, essentially you're coming up with, you see so you your test data set, you're coming up with the patterns, and then you're testing it in the big data set to see if the patterns hold and you're going back and forth. And so intellectually, it was exactly like how you do theory building, only it was on a large scale. And what we realized was that, so that was how they were the same. They're both fundamentally pattern recognition techniques. How they're different is that case study qualitative research is better at figuring out the important mechanisms and the constructs. Whereas machine learning is better at confirming whether the patterns you're seeing are true at scale. And it's also better at picking out nonlinearities and equifinality. So what we did is we put the two together. And so, so the, what the, the methodology that I think is exciting in that paper is that we had this app store data where we had millions and then we cut it down and actually the actual sample gets smaller and smaller so it's only maybe about 2000. Um, first we did fishing and I think that's okay to do fishing if you say you're fishing. We were fishing and then we did case studies and machine learning is a cross-sectional technique. It's not a longitudinal technique and so we did cases but the cases were cross-sectional. 
So we'd look at an app and see what the revenue model is and then try to figure out, well, why is it that Robin Hood lose, uses freemium? And why is it that Open Table does this? And why is it that uh, the New York Times does that? You know, New York Times is, 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 a, is a price model. Um, and why is some free? So we sort of like tried to figure out why the, why the models were different. And we, we did about 40 cases and we stratified the sample where we'd look at about 40 apps and we looked at successful ones and failed ones and we looked in different categories. And we looked you know, in, in categories where, where free was dominant, categories where paid was dominant and categories where freemium was dominant. We also looked for a counterfactual case. So, so a company that was free, that was a free app in a paid category. So we tried to look for counterfactuals. We tried to, from a case point of view, say, okay, what are the drivers of a, the successful apps in terms of their revenue models? And then, so then we had that, and then we had some predictions from the literature as well. And we then put those variables into the machine learning and sort of came out with, you know, what the machine learning would show. And the machine learning would show, it basically confirmed what we were doing, but also showed some equifinal paths that we didn't anticipate. And, and what I think is, I don't know how well I explained this, but what I think is great about this technique, and, and, and this occurred to me, I was at the BYU-Utah Winter Strategy Conference this year, and Emily Feldman and a couple of other people were, were talking, but you know, quant people, and they were talking about you know, large scale studies, and they were talking about hypotheses. And I'm thinking to myself, if they did systematic case studies, they could so much better dial in their mechanisms and then test them on, on, on big data sets and text them in machine learning and, 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 and use machine learning, which gives you the kind of nonlinearities and, and interesting patterns that you can't do in regression. Regression is basically pushing you to the mean. Machine learning is letting you see the richness. And so I think the real, the real excitement from a method point of view is, is this idea of, of of seeding large scale analysis, particularly in machine learning, but, but, but econometrics as well, with systematic case studies to nail in the mechanisms and, and, and the constructs in a much better way than simply sort of guessing or maybe randomly talking to a couple of people you happen to know in the industry. Um, so I think that combination would really serve the field well to, to do that. Um, and I'm not, now I'm a huge fan of machine learning. I love machine learning. Um, because I, I love I love the way you can I love the way you can see the comp, the complexity of, of, of causality. Well, it isn't really causality, but it's the complexity of paths through the data. Did that make sense or or not? Um, I think so. And then, and then if you're interested in revenue models, the paper's pretty good about that too. It shows <laughs> you essentially that revenue models that more successful apps fit what we pre essentially what we showed was that we can predict the revenue models of successful apps. And we can't predict the revenue models of unsuccessful ones. She says, suggests the unsuccessful people don't have a good handle on how to get revenue. And in particular, less successful apps tend to be simplistic. And so they will be paid. And, and, and we also did some interviews too. Um, so a, a paid app where the, where the author of the app says something like, well, I worked really hard and people should pay for it. Or, you know, only as much as a cup of coffee at Starbucks, people should pay for it. But the world doesn't work that way. And so it was actually people who matched their model with what our, our theoretical predictions were, were doing better. And the people who were not doing well were too simplistic. They, do, they were either paid or free, and they didn't, they didn't really explore the richness of freemium, which is a harder model to do, but is where the real payoff is, if, if, if you've got the right kind of, of, of product. That's great. It's exciting to hear about that. And I think you just gave a lot of ideas to people about thinking about machine learning. Um, I hope so, and it's, a, and it's a different app. A lot of people are using machine learning to measure constructs better. And this is, this is more about testing theories better and building theories better. So it's a really, I think, a unique application of machine learning. And also, one last thing about machine learning is it's actually pretty simple. You know, I, I, I benefit from the fact that, that Ron was a, was a data scientist at Spotify. There's no doubt about that. But it's pretty easy to learn and it's pretty intuitive, particularly if you're, you're, you're coming from a qualitative background. It's just so natural to see, to see that pattern recognition and the way it works. That's great. Um, so we had a few com questions that kind of come in that relate to that. So why don't we go to Andrea first? He has a question about interesting phenomena that you see and then 
we'll go to Alicia DeSantola. She has some questions about okay. um, series to explore, and then we'll, I'll go to the next question. So when you're asking a question, come off mute, ask your question, and then remute yourself while Kathy's answering, if that's okay. Emily, can I ask yeah. us to do one thing before we dive into questions, which is yeah. to take a screenshot, if yeah. possible, so we can keep this in memory on our str uh, website so uh everyone looks so lovely so if everyone if you're if you feel comfortable if you can put your video on then we'll take a screenshot and and post this to our site um i promised our communications director paulo that we would do this so maybe when i count to three if everyone could look at your screen and say hi or wave or something all right so Wait, hold on, I'm not doing Cameras are still coming on, so maybe wait for one more second here, Samina. Okay, waiting. Cameras on, you can. you're going to do one, too. All right. Ready? One, two, three, cheese. All right, I think we got a good one. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Oh, thank you, everyone. All right, so we're going to go to Andrea first for a question. You know, I realize we don't all know each other, so when you ask your question, maybe say your full name and where you're at right now, just so we can kind of clue in where everyone's at. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Andrea. Um, so my question was, uh, what are some of the most interesting phenomena that you see happening right now, sort of emerging right now that we as scholars should, uh, should look at? <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I, I, I'm interested these days, and you know, I'm sure there are lots of things that you could be interested in, but I'm, I'm interested in, in looking at different kinds of economic models that firms are using. You know, I, and I think it's, I was think, I got to this point of a, thinking about, you know, game theory, that there's no game in game theory. And yet, I think in business, there are different economic games. And so the game that you play in software is not the same game that you play in a marketplace or that you play in a product. And so I'm getting interested in trying to understand how strategy is different if you're talking about a marketplace. So how do you build a marketplace? versus how do you do software versus ecosystems. So for example, you know, I did a paper with Doug Hanna on, on strategy and ecosystems. I think an ecosystem strategy is really different than a marketplace strategy. So I've got a new paper coming out in SMJ with Tim Ott on building marketplaces. And there, what you're doing is really different than an ecosystem. And the economics are different. And then another, to give you another example, um, uh, Ron Tidhar and I are working on what are called tech-enabled business models, which essentially means uh, companies where there's some sort of physical component they have to deal with. So Rent the Runway is an example, or Stitch Fix, where you have inventory. Once you have inventory, it just makes, it makes the economic game so much different than, let's say, a straight-up software or service. So I'm getting interested in the variety of kinds of e economic games, if you want to call it that, or I like to call it that, or business models that, that, and how those work and how they're, they are the same and different from each other. So I think that's a really interesting area to think about how it's different. I'll give you another example. You know, we're thinking a bit about, well, what strategy look like in a highly institutionalized market? So, so Eric Vollmer and I are looking at online education, where it's a market that you're selling in kind of the university world, but it's also a business. So, so I, I, I'm intrigued by that, and I'm intrigued by growth. How do firms grow? Um, which gets me into things like bottlenecks that I'm very interested in. So how do, how do firms grow, particularly how they, how they grow at the beginning, but then how do they scale? Because why, and why they look like hockey sticks. So I'm, I'm interested in that. And then I, so that's two things. It's, I'm interested in the growth and scaling, and I think that's a new thing. And I'm interested in looking at, at contexts and how, and how strategy is different in those contexts. Great, thank you. Oh. Did you want to say more, Kathy? No, no, I, I, unless Andrea had to, wanted to ask me something else or I, I, or I didn't do the question, but I think I answered it. Yeah, I think that's great. All right, so next we have a question from Alicia DeSantola about theory. And I think um, there's some other people who've had similar theory questions. So okay, let's sure. talk about this, yeah. Hi, Kathy, thanks so much for an interesting talk. Um, I'm Alicia, I'm at the UW, like uh, Emily. And so my question is about theory. Um, what do you think are the most interesting areas of theory to explore today, particularly for more junior scholars? And are there any ones that you think are worth revisiting or maybe have been underdeveloped that it's time to sort of flesh them out? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, that's a tricky question. Um, 
because a lot of the theories that we're still using are the theories that I mentioned when I was a doctoral student, you know, like institutional theory or transaction costs. And so the, back in the day was the time when there was all these, all these different theories. Now it's sort of harder to see what the big new theory might be. So I don't know what that is. I, and, I, and we may be at a time when it's more developing the theories we have um, rather than there being some new theory. I, I think I think there are, maybe it's because it's the world that I enjoy, but I think there, there there's room for theories about, in strategy anyway, about, about ambiguous markets, really new markets and growing markets, because I think those are two different problems. I think am, ambiguous emergent markets, it's more about shaping and it's more about no, I, I'll, 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 I'll mention another paper that, that just came out, a paper that, called Parallel Play with, with Rory McDonald, and I know you know that paper well, Alicia. Um, I, that, that paper, I think one of the big insights in that paper is the idea that at the very beginning of a market, your rivals are not who you think your rivals are. You're, you don't really have a rival. In, in really new markets, it's about shaping the market, which we don't talk about in that paper particularly, but it's also about learning about the market. And so I think one of the big messages in that paper is that your rivals aren't really your rivals and that, that, and that, and one of the things that our, our one of our, our, our executives said was something like, you play the course, not the player, which is like a golf metaphor, but essentially in golf, I don't try to compete with you like I would in tennis. I'm playing the course, I'm not playing you. And so in entrepreneurship in the early days, I think there's something about that that it's fundamentally about learning, not competing. And I think that's, and that's what makes really new markets strategically different than growing markets, where I think growing markets is more about rivalry, is more about uncertainty, is more about timing and speed. So I think all of those themes we know, I don't know that I or anybody's pulled it into a, into a point of view yet, but I would say that's a place where there could be a point of view. Um, there could also be a new theory coming from another context you know, like the Chinese context or some culturally different context. And I don't know what that theory might be. I mean, so far I see, when I see things about China, it mostly kind of looks like here in, in the meaningful ways, but that's probably not true. So I don't know if that went to me, took me too many places, but that's, I'd, I'd say it's around the difference between an, a, a brand new ambigu where ambiguity reigns, where it's about shaping and learning and growth markets and much more about uncertainty and moving quickly. Thanks, that's really interesting. Thanks. Great. Okay, next we have a question from Dongil Kyum um, about how location matters and where you're at. So Dongil, if you want to come off mute and ask that, tell us how to pronounce your name. I'm sorry if I've pronounced it right. It's okay, I go by Daniel. So hi, Kathy. Um, it's, it's, I guess it's more of a personal question on how just being in Bethany, California and in, in, in Stanford campus and being so close to Silicon Valley has impacted you personally and as a researcher. And for people who are in the middle of nowhere, how can we uh, emulate sort of the model and benefits of being in your place? Okay, is, is, this is this is Danny. Is that is Danny Kim? Is that no? Who is it? Um, so I'm Daniel uh, from Columbia University. Oh hi, hi Daniel. Um, yeah, I think I um, I think obviously have benefited from being in Silicon Valley, although I also try very hard to have most of my studies not just be Silicon Valley studies, but I I mean I, I think I've you know, exploited the opportunity that I have being here. I think for other people, I think every region has interesting things going on in it. And if you're a field researcher, those are the things you should study. So, um, you know, SMS was just in Minneapolis. I think the striking feature of Minneapolis is how many major corporations are there. And so if you're sitting in Minneapolis as a field researcher, you probably ought to study big companies. Um, if you're sitting, you know, in, in more of a, a, a Midwestern place, maybe you study, you know, let's say, I'm just guessing here now, but let's say University of Illinois, maybe you look at the ag sector because that's the sector you can know. Um, if you're, again, if you're a field researcher. So I think, I, I do think there's some value in, in taking advantage of, of the place that you happen to be, especially if you're, especially if you see yourself as a field researcher. Did that answer it? Um, thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, thinking back to some of the things you said earlier, Kathy, about how your context and constraints shaped your, you know, especially your dissertation, right? It ties right into that. So. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, well, let me say one other thing about parallel play um, that, that, that I, I may be passing on kind of a value system that I have. Um, if you read ASQ, you saw it in ASQ. If you read HBR, you saw it in HBR. Um, and one of the things that, that I think is important, particularly for more senior people, I think more junior people, you, you, you kind of have to be more focused. But as a senior person, writing to both audiences is important. When I was a PhD student, there was this, there was this um, feeling at Stanford that if you said something to executives, you couldn't be a serious scholar. And that it wasn't theoretical and it wasn't pure. And so people would put theoretical rigor and practical relevance on the ends of a continuum. And I always thought they were orthogonal. And I always thought that the best research could be in SMJ or ASQ or name your favorite theoretical journal. Um, and it could also be in HBR or whatever your favorite you know, executive journal is that, that you, should be, you should be able to take your work and talk to both audiences. And so I was, I was really excited about Parallel Play that, that, H, that last this June, it came out in ASQ, it came out in HBR. Um, that was like, that's like for me personally, like the most exciting thing to have happen to your work is, it, is it's, it's playing to the two audiences. Great. Um, we have another question from Nat Natalia Blackburn um, about building theory as an early researcher. So Natalia, do you wanna come off mute and ask that? Yeah. Hi. Hi, sorry, I'm, I'm calling from Newcastle in the northeast of England. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, just uh, as an early stage researcher, where can I go um, about to learn about theory building? What are the best sources and some of the lessons and tips from you, please? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, you know it's, 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 an, it's an old article, but I do think my 1989 article is a pretty good starting point if you're just getting going. Um, you know, then you may want to read some people's work that you like, you know, you know, like I particularly like Mary Tripsis's work, Marion Glynn. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think I like a lot of different people's work. So I might read what people are writing, sort of see. What makes, what makes theory building from cases hard for junior people is, is it's hard to have the repertoire of literatures to know how to, how to connect it theoretically, um, to see you know, you can see your data and come up with ideas in your data, but what you have more difficulty doing is seeing then how that, how what you're finding is relating to the broader literature and getting the concepts to the right level of abstraction. So that, so it's more that, that not knowing the bigger literature, I don't know what you're studying, but let's say you're studying, I don't know, um, identity. Um, it's, it's, you have to know the identity literature to know what's interesting in your own data. Um, and then be able to connect it. Um, and and I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, a, a paper that would, it's just, it's going to be coming out in SMJ fairly soon with, with, that I did with Tim Ott that we did on marketplaces and how do you build a marketplace? So a company like Airbnb or, um, you know, Uber or whatever, we were looking at marketplaces. Um, and what we did in that paper was was the un, we, we had we saw we could see the patterns of what you know what people were doing and why it was and we, we could see what we, it was it was a study where we ended up with six companies two pairs and and the marketplaces were you know, one was like like dining and another one was parking and the third one was on personal services so the one that was on dining for example was about connecting people who who are ordinary people in some tourist destination with travelers who want a, a, a local experience. So it was connecting, for example, um, a, a traveler to Southeast Asia with, with um, a host, let's say in Hanoi or Bangkok or somewhere, and you can go to their house and you can have food. It was a marketplace to connect that. Um, and so we, we could see how, how there was a way that you would build a marketplace because the underlying problem is it's a complex novel problem. So that's the first thing we could see is because I kind of knew about much about problem solving, we could actually see the deeper, it wasn't just about, well, how do I connect travelers? It was seeing that the problem was a complex novel problem and know the problem solving literature and know that that was actually a contribution in that literature. The other thing that we could do in that paper is we could also tap into the psychology literature. I'm, I'm a believer that, that psychology is much more 
counterintuitive than economics. What makes economics less interesting to me is it's also rational. But, but psychology is not rational and surprising. And so we were able to, on the one hand, see, it, see this marketplace stuff as complex novel problem solving, but we could also see some of the underlying reasons why it worked from a psychological point of view. So that's what I'm getting is, is sort of the range of literature. So on the one hand, we're kind of in problem solving. On the other hand, we're in how do people learn from a psychological standpoint? What does, you know, for example, one of the interesting things is, is that when you focus on something and consciously put other things to the side, you learn more about the side things, even though you're focused, which you kind of wouldn't really think, but that's the way people's minds work. So, so I think one of the challenges for junior scholars in, in, in doing case study research is not being able to, not have been in the field long enough to be able to connect to the literatures that make the paper interesting, to make it more than just about marketplaces, uh, which is uh, marketplaces are sort of interesting on, on their own, but to see it as a, as a deeper problem. So I don't want to be discouraging though, because I think, I think you have to start and I think the review process can help you. I think reviewers can point you to, oh, you know, more deeply, that problem is really this, take a look at this literature, or, you know, think about the underlying reasons why that's working. Oh, there's a literature that might help you. So to go back to the paper on parallel play with Rory McDonald, um, our reviewers pushed us towards optimal distinctiveness, which is a, you know, big construct in organization theory. And that was really helpful. So your reviewers can push you to, to the things you're maybe missing. So did, so did that help or did I, hopefully that did? I think so. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Thank Ronan, you. Do you want to say something or? Nope. Yes, thank you. Um, sorry, did you ask me? I would start, I would start with, I think my 89 paper is a pretty good starting place. And then go to the authors and the topics that you're interested in and see what they do. Thank you. I think many of us start out, and many of us start out copying somebody else. And I know I copied Bob Sutton. Um, and you probably will find the person you copy. But I go copy somebody. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great, great advice. Um, next, we have a question from an up and coming scholar, Costa Mar uh, Costas Marquitas, is going to ask a question. Oh, not Costas. <laughs> ah, hello, Kathy. How are you? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful insight. So we look forward to having you back to London very, very soon. Hopefully yeah. soon enough. Uh, Kathy, uh, I've asked you this question many times before in person, and I think it's important to ask it uh, over Zoom as well, which is you have, um, been, you have remained research active, research productive, extremely successful in that over many, many years. And really, what is the secret to success? How can we remain so passionate about research and publish at the same time as we go <laughs> through our career? Oh, well, thank you, Costas. Um, I, I would say the, the big thing for me has been my students. My students come, they're always, you know, they're new, they're fresh, um, they have ideas I haven't thought of. So like the machine learning, I and mean, I, I was kind of curious about machine learning, but then Ron shows up at my doorstep and knows how to do it. Or, you know, somebody else comes up with an idea and wants to do something and, and say, oh, that's cool. So I, I think the students have kept me, kept me fresh. Um, I think the other thing is you just get better at doing it so it's not as hard. Although I will say I'm pretty sick of reviewers. I don't know how you feel about it, Costas, but I'm planning to like kind of over reviewers. So, um, so I'm think I'm actually thinking about writing some books now. I'm I'm kind of like oh, I don't think I want to do the review process anymore. Um, and how do you keep the passion, Kathy? I think it's the new ideas. I, I mean, I've always been an idea person, and so I'm doing the machine learning, or I'm doing this economic games thing, or I'm doing, I uh, you know, it may sound a little boring, but you know, this idea of looking at at, at how does inventory change the way you do a venture. I think is, it's just the sort of, it's, it's a new thing. So I, I enjoy that. Um, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I enjoy, it. maybe it's also because, um, you know, I was a little bit of a slow starter. I probably didn't publish my first paper for maybe three years or five years or something. I don't, it took a long time. I had, all, I had these little kids, you know I mean? I, so I was I the CEO husband and little kids. So you can imagine who was minding the kids. Um, 
and and I wanted to be hands-on with my kids. So I was I was a bit of a slow starter, and then um, so I you know in some sense I, I think my my age is I'm actually younger in my career than my age, although maybe I'm not that young as I think about it. If I'm talking about papers 30 years ago, um, anyway, that's 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 what I what I've been thinking about Costas is I think it's it's, it's the students are fun, um, and they take me in places that I hadn't thought of. So it's always something new. Thank you, Kathleen. Now, so you are a wonderful example for all of us to emulate. <laughs> well, thank you, Gustus. Um, yeah, and it's nice, you know, thank you, Kathy. Also, I think during COVID, a lot of us are thinking about childcare and family commitments, you know, and it, it's nice that you mentioned that, you know, that is not necessarily something that held you back, right? So I think that's a hopeful message <laughs> for a lot of us right now. Yeah, you know, it, the, the hard thing about your, your 30s is you have your kids and you have your career and you only have a 24 hour day. You know, so you really need that 35 hour day, but you don't have it. Yeah, so it's tough. Um, thank you. All right, so next up we have a question from Ransim um, Kuragu um, and, uh, about writing theory papers as a junior scholar. Okay. Should I? Uh, yeah, ask should I Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm a junior scholar and I'm not positioned in a you know, better reputable university. I'm basically located in Turkey, even, even though it is Turkey's best university. So um, many of my colleagues are criticizing me because I'm trying to write theory papers, but that's my passion. I read a lot. Uh, I want to synthesize. I want to create different concepts. I want to introduce new ideas. But uh, as I mentioned, many of my colleagues are criticizing my strategy. Would you recommend giving up and uh, prioritizing um, empirical works for junior researchers? Well, if, yeah, if, if you mean theory, like just straight up theory and no data, like I, yeah. I, I differentiate yeah. between straight up theory, no data, and case study research, because case study research is driving from data. I think it's very hard to write straight theory without data or formal models or simulation or something and just write it out of your head. Um, it tends to be not very interesting. I mean, it's I mean, you might be a really smart, you're probably a really smart guy, but you probably, like the only person I can think of who did that was Herb Simon, and most of us aren't Herb Simon. Um, so I think it's hard to do that. I, I, I would say just, just the, I think you can do qualitative research. I think that works. I think simulation works. I think other things work. But no data type papers, it's very hard to be original and interesting. It's very hard to do that because you don't have the repertoire of, of, of understanding how things fit together. Um, so I think it's hard to do that. Uh, I'm also a pragmatist. I mean, uh, you know, coming from a science engineering background, we are about getting it done. Um, and so I'm more inclined like to say to someone like you to do kind of what I do with my dissertation was, I don't love agency theory. I don't care about retail sales compensation very much, but I know what I need to do to get the job done, to be at the place where I can then be the person I wanna be. And so there is that process of, you know, you got to get tenure and pull, and then the whole world opens up for you. And then you can be the theoretician you always wanted to be, or the, or the management consultant, or the dean, or the editor, or the leader in some other way. Um, but I think you kind of have to, I would say you have to play the game. Thank you very much. Sure. And good luck with that. I love Turkey, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're going back to Kathy telling us to play the course, not the player earlier. It sounds like maybe <laughs> in our careers a little bit. like that, yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I think I think you do have to get things certain things done and and I'm at least a person who's who's, you know, pragmatic. Thank you. Um all right, next up we have a question from Elena um about the future of different research methods. Elena, can sure. you there you are. Uh, hi everyone. Hi Kathy. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all those interesting insights. So, um, I mean, we, we all know like that you brought those intellectual pieces on different research methods, like case studies, simulations, you know, about machine learning. I understand you also uh, right, working on a, a formal model. So, I was wondering, like, what's your, uh, what are your thoughts about you know, which methods you see as more uh, promising? Uh, do you, how do you see them working together? Yeah. Um... I, I guess I see, yeah, I, I am I am actually working on a, I'm not working on a formal model myself, 
but we're working on a paper, a methods paper about formal models and how people who don't do formal models can use formal models because we, th we think it's an underutilized method. And actually I'm, I'm working that with, with Doug Hanna and, and, and Ron Tidhar. And Doug did a survey of, of what kinds of papers are most cited and controlled for, you know, status of the person, the authors and so on. And formal models are the least cited papers um, as a type. Whereas actually qualitative research is the most cited of all the, of all the sort of methods, uh, you know, on sites per paper. Um, and so we wanted to write something about formal models, but, but I, I think, I, I, I don't know that individual people can do it or even particularly junior scholars, but I think there's a lot of value in different methods because they do different things. So when I was talking about machine learning, machine learning and qualitative research are both about pattern recognition, but then they're different and, they're, and they have really nice complementarities. I think simulation is a method that has some very, very nice complementarities with, with case studies and qualitative research. So I, th I, 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 like, I like lots of methods. I don't think, I don't think as a junior scholar, it's a good idea to have a lot of methods. I think you ought to sort of learn one method and do it. But then in your career, maybe expand to other methods and to read other methods and to realize what those methods can do. Um, for example, one of my all time favorite papers of mine um, is, is a simulation. That, that Jason Davis, Chris Bingham and I did. It came out in ASQ about 10 years ago. Actually, it was the Scholarly Contribution Award for ASQ. But it was a simulation. And we took the ideas of simple rules that we'd gotten from case studies and we simulated it. And you could just do things in simulation you couldn't do qualitatively. You could see things, you know, you could see shapes of things um, in a way you could never do with qualitative. Qualitative research gives you, gives you big patterns. Um, but it doesn't give you precision. Um, and so this, the, the simulation just so complemented the other stuff that we were doing. So I think whether you, whether you have multiple methods yourself, which is hard, a little hard to do when you're junior, but I do believe in, in reading broadly um, and, and understanding the value of different methods. Um, and again, I, I look primarily from the point of view of the complementarities of qualitative research with other methods. I think simulation is great for expanding qualitative insights. I think formal models are great. I think formal modeling people should use case studies more because I think we can give them interesting ideas and then they can, they can unpack the phenomenon and, and, and get to the mechanism better than you can in cases. And then obviously, you know, econometrics has its place too. I think that's, we kind of all, all, we all kind of know the story on econometrics. So yeah, so as a junior scholar, I'd say stick with one thing, but I would read broadly. And then as you get on in your life, you might want to work with something, somebody that has that complementary skill. Great. And both, and yeah. Sergey has a related question about um, how to make quantitative research relevant, interesting for qualitative audiences. Do you want to come off mute? Sergey? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for being with us, Katie, and sorry for being boring, but yeah, another uh, methods question. Uh, so there are two big camps qualitative and quantitative researchers, right? And uh, I'm part of the quantitative camp, but if mm -hmm. I think of qualitative camp, then Kadi Eisenhardt is the first name that pops up in my mind. So my question to you would be, uh, and, and uh, honestly, I really love qualitative research. I think like you have huge flexibility in, in the way you approach the, the question and the data. And as a quantitative researcher, I'm kind of in an iron cage where there is this standard flow of the way to write papers, right? So uh, my question to you would be like, is there a way for a quantitative researcher to be interesting and relevant to the qualitative researchers? Or this disconnect is, is larger than I think? I mean, I, th I think there are parts of qualitative research that are not interested in quantitative research. I think there's a set of people who, who truly are not. Um, I think that's not people like me, or let's say, uh, yeah, pe people like me are not like that. So, and people like Violina Rindova or Suresh Kota or Mary Chipsis or Mary Anglin or, you know, so people like, like that, we're interested in, 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 in quantitative work as well. I think, I think quantitative work is more interesting for a qualitative researcher. By the way, is that background bothering you hear the, truck peak being? Uh, we can hear it, but I think it's okay. Okay. Um, I, think, I think the degree to which you go into the field 
and you interview people about whatever your topic is. Let's suppose you're, I don't know, you're studying acquisitions. Then you get out in the field and you talk to, you know, 10 people even. You know, it doesn't have to be like some big deal. But just talking to 10 people so that you have more of a sense of what your variables mean, what the causal struct, what, what, what the likely causality is. Um, so you just, so you have a, just a richer, a richer story. Um, I think Emily's dissertation is a good example of that, where she was interested in, 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 in funding and how funding, different sources of funding, government, VC, whatever, uh, affected innovation trajectories. I think the fact that she went out and actually talked to entrepreneurs and talked to funders gave the paper a richness and an authenticity that is appealing to qualitative researchers. So the degree to, and I also think it makes it, frankly, a better quantitative paper too. So the degree to which you can informally uh, get out and talk to people so you understand your setting better. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that would be, that would be the way to connect. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you. Okay, so next up we have uh, Interina. I'm not sure how to say your name correctly. I apologize. If you could introduce yourself and ask your question about simple rules and heuristics. Yes, uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Cassie. Thank you very much for insight. Uh, I'm Dorina Antoni from Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. And my question to you is uh, non method related. <laughs> so, um, uh, what I would like to ask is where do you see uh, the research on simple rules and heuristics going? And in particular, I was wondering what do you think about the interplay of politics and heuristics? And in particular, the use of uh, politics, let's say, for large established organizations to tackle challenges, uh, uh, for instance, grant challenges. Yeah, I didn't quite catch, maybe there was one couple words in the middle I didn't quite catch. You asked mm -hmm. me, what do I think about simple rules in the context of large organizations? Yeah, how do you see the interplay of simple rules and, and, and politics? Politics, oh, in, okay. In tackling grand challenges, when I say politics, like the use of, we normally know politics as manipulation and lobbying and, and so on and so forth, but can we see the heuristics uh, uh, interplaying with politics in, in perhaps having a more effective and responsible um, uh, aspect in, in tackling grand challenges? Right, right. Yeah, I think, I think heuristic simple rules um, are, are relevant when you do repeated things. So simple rules apply to things like, could apply to lobbying, it could apply to acquisitions, it could apply to hiring. So something that you could do repeatedly, whereas it doesn't apply to something that's one time, like, you know, there are simple rules for getting married. Because, you know, people get married once or maybe twice, maybe three times, but like, it's not like a repeated process. So simple rules make sense when, when, when you're repeating what you're doing. And so, for example, if you saw that, um, your passion was around climate change. And you want, you might think of some simple rules about, well, if I'm going into a city, uh, what, what, you know, do I talk to the mayor or do I talk to somebody else? Is my pitch, you know, what are some of the ideas of my pitch? Do I pitch this or do I pitch that? So you sort of get some heuristics um, where you're, you're, you're sort of lightly guiding whatever it is you're doing in, in whatever, but it's gotta be something that repeats. Um, so, for example, one of the one of the one of the examples we use in in the in the simple rules which is actually came from Don, but it's about the Jesuits, which is one of the most successful priest orders in the Catholic Church. If you want to talk about success, um, and when they started, they were they had heuristics for going overseas, and they and this all the, what they did was the heuristics were get out and talk to people and not be in the monastery, which is what most of the priests were doing. Get out and talk to people, go in pairs, um, focus on education, and fit in. And so, they, and, and the fitting in meant that they did some, one thing in Japan and a different thing in India, but it was always about education. It was always about going in pairs, and it was, you know, and a couple other things are involved in the story too, but essentially it was, it was a few things that you do. And so I think in politics, it's around, you know, who are, who are the decision makers you want to hit? What's the, the pitch you want to make? When do you decide that this, this let's say, city, they're never going to do what you're interested in? When do you walk away? Uh, so I would see it more like that. I mean, it's, it's kind of like how, how Uber expanded, only it's from a poor political agenda. Does, does that make sense to you? I think you're, I think you're muted now. Yeah, I'm going to unmute you. 
Selena. Yes, Selena. yes, <laughs> thank you. So, and then in terms when you say this repetitive action, uh, can this repetitive action uh, be taken into a context of, let's say, uh, two to three years, or does it require more repetition before we say that it's a simple rule? So how well, think, when do these repetitive actions have to be? Is that what you're asking? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah I mean, I think it has to be often enough so that so that there's so so you're getting because what we're, what, what something like simple rules does is it lets you scale faster because you don't have to keep relearning what you're going to do in a place you've already got some of the ideas and you just go do it um so if it's if you're having like long gaps of two or three years then that's more of a one-time only thing whereas if you see it more as a bunch of things you're doing in parallel i think simple rules make more sense so you know it's like internationalizing or hiring or going to different cities or something that you're doing somewhat repeatedly thank you okay up next we have a question from jing tong about productivity and time management <laughs> hello professor Cassie. uh i'm jing uh, a -year phd student uh in strategy at Granite purdue university oh, yeah. so, uh, i'm not that experienced in asking you some questions about <laughs> research topics so I only have like, I'm wondering about like how you can be so fast or efficiently in doing your studies, especially I know that you have two kids and your husband cannot help, right? <laughs> so obviously I don't have kids. Uh, I may have more time <laughs> compared with you. Yeah. Well, work does expand the filters that I'm allotted. Um, well, first of all, I will say my, my parents are Purdue grads. Oh, so yeah, so I, I've heard about Purdue forever. Um, time management, um, I don't multitask all that well. Okay. And so I like to really, when I'm re doing research, I'm doing research. When I'm teaching, I'm teaching. When I'm having fun, I'm having fun. And I don't, I don't mix those. Because this is not back in the day, but um, you know, when my kids would be, if my kids were around, I didn't try to also do research. You know, because then I, I was a, a bad mom and a poor researcher. So I, I tried to compartmentalize. So I might spend my, morning on research or a day on research and then i'd take my daughter to the you know, gymnastics carpool um and i'd be and then i'd be in the mom role so i i compartmentalized and and, and, and in my teaching research um emily would know this i stack all my teaching in the fall and that's all i do and i try and i try to give the students the absolute best experience i can and then end of the fall quarter i don't even want to hear from them i'm now in a different place so i i found that focusing because there's so much switching cost. So I, I find focusing and then also then, but then you can focus too much, let's say on research and, 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 and then lose sight of the fact that you need a day off. So I, I, would, I would structure a day off, time off, you know, maybe you, you know, a lot of people need to exercise. So I would have an exercise time. Um, so I would also structure, you need a fun time. Uh, you know, so you have to structure in your fun, before you have your fun time. Um, <laughs> It's quite hard to have fun here in West Lafayette, but yeah, I will try to have a fun time. <laughs> um, but well, yeah. you know, or, or you have to redefine fun. <laughs> I don't know. Just, just one eight up question. So, uh, when when you have like uh, multiple research projects carrying on at the same time, and probably you will get frustrated because one project didn't work out very well. And so, how do you handle that? How do you still focus on other projects? So th that's actually oh, if one doesn't work out well. Um, I don't know. I haven't had a bad project in a while, <laughs> so I don't know what to do. On a bad you know, I, I yeah, I will. I've had I've had papers that's found no love. Um, this is actually another thing I learned from Bob Sutton, and he I mean, he must be the man of slogans, but he was every paper has a home. And so, and then he would say, just put it in your drawer, and someday, sometime, you will find that home. And I think that's kind of true. You know, okay, I don't know what to do with this thing. Nobody likes it. It's not working. Put it in the drawer and something will happen. Like there'll be a special issue on that topic or a book chapter or something. Or somebody else will see that paper and see something in it that you missed. So I would, I would, I would cut my losses and put it in the drawer. And some things never come out of the drawer. But most of the time it will come out of the drawer. But I wouldn't keep, you know, trying to you know, squeeze blood out of a stone. The next question is actually related to that topic. So Tunde, if you want to ask Kathy your question. It is. 
Hi, everyone. Hi, Katie. Can you guys Hi. hear me? Yep. So I'm Tunde. I'm based in Denmark, where I am an assist incoming assistant professor at Aarhus University. And what I'm interested in is what we cannot see by reading your CV. So what are the characteristics of the projects that you ultimately decided against? As a junior scholar, I'm especially interested in this because uh, whether you have any advice on how to say no, uh, especially to senior people in our field. <laughs> um, well, when I was at your career stage, I, I, I got overcommitted and did too many things at once. And it was actually not, I mean, it, it worked out in the end, but it was actually not good. Um, so how do you, I mean, I think you can, one of the interesting things about saying no to senior people is that sometimes senior people will ask you to do things and they think you should say no, but they ask you anyway. Well, this is particularly service, but it's other things too. So they'll say, oh, you know, they'll ask you and they'll actually be happy when you say something like, you know, I'd love to do that thing with you, but I've got these other things to do and I just got to get these done. So I think you think they're going to be more upset than they are. And in fact, sometimes senior people are asking you to do things that they think you should say no to. And I don't know why they're asking you exactly, other than it's good for them. Um, but I think if you, if you can honestly say, I'd love to do that, or maybe you wouldn't love to do it, but you say that, um, but that you, you say a couple other things that you're doing, you just say, you know, I just have to prioritize these other things. I think most senior people, most people get that that you have to prioritize and, and you can't do everything. As a junior, you said yes to everything? I did too much, yes, I did. Um, and I was basically, I, I got to working with both K and J, as I mentioned before. And you know, the K project was a quant study, but it was, had a lot of field stuff in it. And then the other one was the other thing. And I had, for a while there, I had too many things to do. And then I had my kids and, you know, it was just, it was just really too crazy. Um, you know, in retrospect, I'm glad I did them both, but I kind of wish I'd, I'd staged them a bit more. Um, but I, I, I am a believer to some extent in, in some degree of randomness. So doing something because it just sounds interesting. Although I'm also a, a person who says you ought to focus. So on the one hand, I'm my three papers makes a stream person. On the other hand, I'm into a little bit of randomness too. Thank you. Okay, sure. How are things in Denmark, by the way? Are, are, you, are you all healthy there and back to, back yes. to normal? A new normal, but yes, I'm, for example, in my office uh, and faculty is allowed back on campus. Oh, yeah, I'm in my office, but I had to get special permission. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, we've got a couple more questions uh, before we wrap up. So we have a question um, from Dinora asking about case studies. So you've come to the right person to ask Kathy that question. Dinora, if you can come off mute. All right, maybe we'll come back to Dinora. So Dinora, if you're there, send me a chat and we'll come back to your question. Um, Juist, you have a question about identity. Oh, hey, Kathy, this is uh, Joost from uh, UCL School of Management in London. Oh, hi there, I, I, we've met, I, right? Yes, we have. Yes, we have, yes, yes. Um, thank you for your insights. So you talked a bit about um, your early work on agency theory, but you're also very well known for a whole bunch of different things. So I wanted to ask you about the importance of identity as a junior scholar, and what are some of the things we can do to kind of establish that identity? Yeah, I think identity is very important for a junior scholar. Um, when I came up from my mid-career review, you know, it's like three or four years or whatever it was, um, I had a very hard time because I was both Writing, writing in organization theory and writing in strategy. And I was playing to both audiences and it became crystal clear that that was a bad strategy. Uh, and so I, my, my, more, my, my more core identity was organization theory. And so I, I forgot about strategy and wrote in organization theory. Um, and so I think as a junior scholar, you do have to pick an identity and you have to pick a community that you're talking to. You might even have a list at your office of the influencers who are going to write for you in your community and you have the, the, the 10 names and you're saying, how am I connecting with these people? But, and you have to do three papers makes a stream and you have to you know, organize a PDW or a session at the academy or something, but you have to pick something and you have to, I think, not agonize too much about that because you have to keep in mind the long game 
of you have to have that identity for a few years and then you don't have to have that identity. So I, I think it's a huge thing early on to have an identity and a focal group you're talking to and a focal set of journals you're writing to. Um, so you become the guy or the woman on whatever topic it is. Um, and you're that for a while so that when people like me write letters for you, I can say, oh, Joost, am I saying that right? No, I'm probably not. It's Joost, like, yeah, like toast. Yeah. Yeah, Yost like those. Thank you. I, I can I reckon write Yost. Yost Yost is the leading junior scholar on blank. That I, I can write that sentence, um, and that's what the people who are reading the letters want to want to read. Um, so you have to, even though it might not be. I know you know the, the guy from Turkey before was saying how he wanted to do some other things. I, I think you have to you have to be pragmatic about about focus and identity, and 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 getting yourself known. That's another tip I'll, I'll share with you. Um, I mentioned Jeff Pfeffer was on my committee and he gave me probably the best, some of the best advice of my career between Bob and, and Jeff. Um, but Jeff said, you know, Kathy, you do great stuff, but you have to market. And it was sort of like novel to me. Oh, you mean I have to market? And he said, oh yeah, you have to market. And so you have to have substance because nobody wants a bunch of marketing that's not substantive. But once you have substances, you have to let the world know what it is you're doing how your work connects with what they're doing, create occasions that you can talk to people, events that you organize, and, and become the guy, in your case, of whatever it is. Okay. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. Thanks, yeah, Kathy. Thanks a lot, Yoast. Yoast like Toast. Well, and thank you, Yoast, yeah. everyone else whose name that I have mispronounced. I appreciate your patience, and feel free to send me an email or a text, and uh, next time I'll, I'll try to do a better job on that. Um, Dinora, Dinora, are you there? Did you have a question? Okay. Yes. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kathy, for all your insights. I'm from Brazil. I'm from the south of Brazil, actually. Uh, my university is Univali. I'm a professor here. I'm studying internationaliz internationalization process. Uh -huh. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing some qualitative research. And I'm always, and sorry for my pragmatic or positivist question, but how many interviews uh, in a case study are you suggesting? Because uh, I I'm, I'm found some you know, they, reviewers I, they, that has blocked my, my research about it. <laughs> Just a number of interviews. You know, I... Um, I don't think there's a really like a like a fixed number and it's some depends on what you're studying so like if you're studying product innovation you'd probably have a lot of interviews if you're studying um acquisition you might have only a few so it sort of depends on how many people are relevant to what you're talking about and are you getting a rich set of perspectives i think in general i'd say my studies probably have 60 to 80 interviews. I think that's sort of a guess. But again, it's, it's about it's about what the topic is, and 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 who is relevant in that topic. And some topics only a you know, small set of people are relevant, and other topics lots of people are relevant. And I think it is about numbers, but it's also about the variety of people that you're talking to. Um, so are you talking? Let's say it's acquisitions. Are you talking to the buyer and the seller? Are you talking to the intermediaries? Are you talking? You know, so you're talking to the right people. So it is about numbers, but it's also about the triangulating the perspectives. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, are we are we winding down, Emily? Oh, yeah, sorry, my, I think my internet froze just a second. Yeah, we've got a couple more questions from our division chair, Samina Kareem, for you. Okay. I wanted to ask, oh, yeah, you can hear me, right? Okay. Yep, I'm I Kathy, I wanted to end with some fun questions and, th and things that I'm curious about. Um, okay, sure. I really, really would love if you would write a book about simple rules for marriage. I think that would help us all. That would be great. <laughs> uh, the closest thing I ever read was a book called Spousonomics. <laughs> um, that was written by two women, which is a fun read for everyone. Okay. Um, so I would love to know what you do to unplug. Like when 
you, you're, you do so much and it's so clear through your students that you're so active and as Costa said, you're a role model for us all. And I think many of us struggle with how to unwind or unplug. And my question is, do you get a chance to do that? And how do you do it? How do I, how do I unplug? Um, I unplug, I, 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 I just have certain times that I just like, like this past weekend, I was in, I was in Lake Tahoe. I have a house in Tahoe and I was up with my family and um, we have no television. We have no internet and you know, I can get, I can, I can communicate with Emily on my cell phone, but otherwise I can't. So I, 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 I do shut off. I, I try not to send emails on the weekend, for example, because then people send me back emails. Mm -hmm. So if you don't send, you don't get. Um, so I try to unplug electronically. Um, you know, I, I, I try to, I try to unplug electronically. I try to have times when I'm really focused on having fun. Um, I have a great friend network. Me and my, me and my, my, my kids grew up. Although interestingly in the COVID period, I talk to my daughter every day, like normal times. I don't talk to my daughter every day. Now I'm talking to her two or three times a day. Um, but, but I have a great group of friends too, that we've been friends for years. We raised our kids together. Um, and they don't care at all about what I do professionally. Um, like, like they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't care in the slightest. They did enjoy reading Simple Rules. My book group read Simple Rules, but other than that, so I have a whole like other world of my family and my friends that, that I unplug with, and and I do I do unplug electronically. Um, in fact, I, I was I will reveal. I told Emily not to tell anyone this, but this is actually my first Zoom meeting, you know, video Zoom meeting, because I I listen on audio, but while I'm on audio, I'm like taking a walk, I'm making my lunch, mm. I'm doing other stuff. Okay. So, so I, I like, I, I think unplugging electronically is super important. So I'm going to tell my husband, we need a house in Tahoe where I can unplug. Okay, great. <laughs> Shut that internet down. <laughs> um, another question I have is, do you have a favorite author or a favorite book or certain genres of books that you like to read? Um, well, I belong to a book club. And so my book club picks out the books and I, and I kind of, they're, they're more literary than I am. Um, I, I like mysteries. I'm a mystery reader. Um, I think I also read magazines and I read, um, I read Scientific American and I read National Geographic and I read Sunset, the magazine of Western living. So I, it's kind of like a women's -y type magazine, but then I like the science stuff. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to, to science, to nature. So I, I, I read magazines. And I read, and I read, I like mysteries and I, then I read whatever my book club is reading. Yeah. And sometimes I just fake it because I haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, I've done that too. Um, favorite dessert. Oh yeah. I saw that question. I, I don't have a favorite. Well, anything chocolate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but my favorite ice cream, I know that's on the list too. My favorite ice cream is peppermint, which is very hard to find in the West. Mine too. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah, and you know, is Emily, aren't you doing research on the chocolate industry? I am, yeah. So maybe Kathy, you want to do some field work with me and Manuela when we're working on that one again. So. That sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Kathy. I, I, I want to thank you on behalf of the entire division for, for making the time to do this. And I think the Zoom call went fantastic. And I want to thank Emily and Andrea for moderating and logistics as well. And Emily, I'll let you close out the session. Well, thank you to everyone for your participation, your questions. Even though I've had the benefit of knowing Kathy for a while now, I learned so much from um, her perspectives and from the questions you asked her. So thank you everyone. And please join us tomorrow. There is another STR Stronger initiative and you can be doing this every weekday for this, this month. I think it's such a nice opportunity to connect with each other and with um, senior scholars and to learn. So have a great day or night wherever you're at and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Kathy. Bye, everyone.